to welcome Bereshek and Peter Neufeld to Duke University. Uh, as you know, they're here to uh, discuss their work with the Innocence Project, uh, which is the subject of their new book, Actual Innocence. Uh, after hearing from them, I'm sure that all of you haven't bought their books and then run out and do so. Uh, Barry and Peter began their legal careers in the mid-1970s uh, as attorneys with the Legal Aid Society in New York City, uh, working in the Bronx. Uh, Barry graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, Peter from the uh, New York University School of Law. Following their tenure at the Legal Aid Society, uh, they went separate ways but continued to practice law together. Uh, Barry became a law professor at Cardozo uh, School of Law in New York, uh, where he ran the school's criminal law clinic, uh, and Peter went into private practice. But they continued to handle cases together, increasingly focusing on the use of DNA evidence to free individuals who had been wrongfully convicted. Uh, eventually, they called their work the Innocence Project, and Barry and Peter are now co-directors of the project, which is housed at Cardozo School of Law. The Innocence Project has been responsible for freeing more than 20, more than 40 wrongfully convicted persons, a number of them uh, who were serving, who were on death row awaiting uh, execution. At a time when many of us uh, will measure our careers by the bill of hours, uh, it's, uh, it's inspirational to hear from two lawyers whose work reminds us of the higher calling of our profession. Please welcome Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. If you don't mind, we've been, uh, we've been hitting every law school in the country. <laughs> And so we're going to sit and then talk back and forth and for a few minutes and then uh, answer some questions. Actually, the first thing that uh, I should tell you is uh, uh, it's great to be here and see all these old friends. Uh, uh, Jim Coleman and Jerusalem Newman came and uh, uh, visited us with us in June uh, about setting up the program along with Rich Rosen from the UNC and of course uh, uh, we've known Don Beskin for uh, so long. And, one of the things is that there's this lawyer named Rudolph. Does he teach here too? Or is he? Yeah. Uh, uh, he started as a legal aid lawyer in the South Bronx with us. Uh, I, but I don't think he acknowledges that. I think he's really from North Carolina. Uh, but in any event, the way uh, we wrote this book, that's really a, a, a book that we hope is, uh, uh, we're going to describe a bit in this talk as kind of a roadmap to what we see as a very interesting and exciting movement uh, that's going around the country, uh, particularly among law students, law professors, uh, and journalism students and journalism professors that we're going to discuss. But just to give you a sense of how it all started, uh, we wrote this book with a fellow named Jim Dwyer, who's a, a journalist in New York who actually helped get a number of these people out of jail by writing a lot of stories. He's a pursuing <coughs> journalist. He's one uh, two Pulitzer Prizes. And we went into the uh, uh, publishers and we said, look, this is the idea for the book. This is how we're going to do it. Boom, 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 boom. Stories, causes, blah, blah, blah. And they looked at us and they said, you know what you've got to do? This could be good. But you've got to be able to guarantee us that the day your book comes out, you can get an innocent person out of jail. Can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise, we're not sure it's going to sell. So sure enough, about two weeks ago, uh, the book comes out. We do all these you know, TV and interview shows and everything. We wind up at Barnes & Noble on Union Square and 14th Street, Manhattan, which is just a few blocks from the law school. And we're going through you know, book signing, whatever. And all of a sudden, this cell phone goes off. And it's a prosecutor from Riverside, California, saying that uh, uh, this fellow named Herman Atkins, who had been in for 12 years for a crime he didn't commit, that the FBI confirmed the test of the laboratory that we were using, and he was free to leave. But of course, uh, they went into court at 4.45 uh, Pacific time to go get the order so that no press could come uh, to try to uh, keep the attention level low 
and then they released him from some prison in the middle of the desert, Ironwood, in Blythe, California, uh, the next morning, which is like eight hours drive from Los Angeles so that they could make sure that no cameras were covering it. But our real purpose here is to try to bring to everybody's attention what's going on with these cases. Um, Jim mentioned in his introduction about our legal work uh, on the frontier of DNA technology. Um, I want to assure you all, this is not a book about DNA. Uh, it's not a book about science. Um, how many of you in this room ever even considered a career in medicine as opposed to law? I want you to know that's more than all the other law schools can find. <laughs> Is, is if you're like Barry and me, we couldn't deal with high school chemistry. And that's why we chose the career in the law. Um, this is not a book about DNA. DNA simply was the method for getting these people out of prison. From our point of view, the much more provocative question, the much more compelling issue that we have to address in this society is how the heck they got into prison in the first place. How did so many innocent people get swept up out of their homes and workplaces, get prosecuted for crimes they didn't commit, get convicted, and in eight instances, get sentenced to death. Uh, to date, in this country alone, there have been 64 people in the last decade who were convicted, who had their convictions affirmed on appeal, only to be exonerated ultimately with DNA testing. And then there are another six people in Canada for a total of 70. And we believe, quite frankly, that the numbers of innocent people who may be languishing in prison could well be in the thousands. And the number of people on death row could well be in the hundreds, all of whom are innocent. And the source of that statistic, interestingly enough, comes from none other than the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They began doing um, DNA typing on cases routinely that were referred to them by police departments all over the United States in about 1989. And in the first 8,000 cases alone that they did, there were sexual assault cases and sexual assault homicide cases. When they did the DNA testing on these people who had already been arrested based on eyewitness identification, based on circumstantial evidence, they excluded the first 2,000 suspects with DNA testing. And uh, other laboratories were coming out with similar numbers. In fact, in the first 18,000 people, there were 4,000 people cleared. Suspects prior to trial with DNA testing, already arrested. Now you know, intuitively, that a lot of those people without DNA testing, had they gone to trial, would have been convicted. Not all 25%, but easily perhaps several hundred, if not a thousand. And if you extrapolate from that, all the people who, prior to the development of DNA testing, went to trial with uh, eyewitnesses, went to trial with snitches, went to trial with uh, other kinds of, um, you know, uh, not such good evidence, uh, they too would have been convicted, sentenced to prison. And from that, we've uh, easily concluded that there may be hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent people who need to get out. So what this book does is it analyzes the causes of all those unjust convictions. We went through the 70 cases. We highlight, highlight them with, uh, with 10 in particular, each case illustrating a different problem in the criminal justice system for causing unjust convictions. It will be no surprise to you that the most common characteristic was mistaken eyewitness identification. About 84% of these cases involve that, that factor alone. Uh, other cases involve false confessions. When we say false confessions, we mean confessions that were either coerced or statements that were never made at all, but simply attributed to the defendant by the police. We're talking about jailhouse snitches, people who are trying to get a few years shaved off their own sentence by ratting on the guy in the next cell. 25% uh, of the cases involve jailhouse snitches. We're talking about uh, fraudulent science, fraudulent forensic science. Uh, forensic scientists uh, working in crime laboratories who simply lied under oath or, or have phony data. We're talking about sloppy forensic science, where forensic scientists exaggerate the significance of the data to help the prosecution get a conviction. We're talking about prosecutors who crossed the line. 50% of these cases involve police officers who committed police misconduct. And unfortunately for us, having come from a background as public defenders, we're talking about cases where defense lawyers simply fell asleep in court or fell asleep on the job and didn't follow up on leads and <coughs> alibis and the rest. And about 20 to 25 percent of the cases fall into that category. So these are the causes of unjust conviction. And uh, we offer reforms as well, uh, simple reforms that we think everybody will join behind. But more importantly, in some ways, if you're going to read the book, uh, 
it's about stories. When are you going to read the book? Not it. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a free country. Uh, I think that the, the idea behind this book was to really put you in the position of trying to see and feel what it's like uh, to be an individual who's convicted of a crime you, that you didn't commit. I mean, it's the ultimate Kafkaesque experience. So you will meet people, the really ordinary people. Uh, you know, oil burner repairman from uh, Virginia, uh, a high school science teacher in Oklahoma, along with the minor league baseball player, one of the great prospects to be coming out of Oklahoma, both convicted uh, of a rape murder they didn't convict. The ball player came within five days of execution. He was literally in his jail cell, holding on to the bar, screaming, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, until he lost his voice. They walked in and they asked him and his sister <clears throat> for the measurements for his coffin, uh, you know, which family and next of kin to notify, how he wanted to be buried, uh, what he wanted for his last meal. Uh, there's the story of uh, Kurt Bloodsworth, who was an oyster fisherman in Maryland uh, and a former United States Marine. Uh, who was uh, brought to trial and convicted of raping and murdering a little girl with five eyewitnesses saying he did it, a crime he didn't commit. But as so often is the case with these people, because they're innocent, they absolutely cannot believe that this is going to happen to them. Um, and you, you know, uh, Kurt describes how uh, the loneliest moment that he ever had in his life is when the jury filed in after all the evidence was presented and they pronounced him not just guilty, but sentenced him to death, that the entire courtroom broke out in applause. Uh, so these are, you know, chilling stories in some ways, uh, but also inspiring, because all of these people uh, somehow managed to survive these experiences, uh, some of them in uh, very, very triumphant ways. Uh, but it's not just the story of these individuals, it's also the story of their families. So it's one of the ways that they were able to survive is that several of these people had incredibly strong, supportive mothers, fathers, uh, sisters, and brothers, and in one instance, uh, a very supportive uh, daughter uh, in Oklahoma, who he would never let visit him at the prison, but nevertheless uh, correspond with him every single day. And as soon as he came time to get out, she was there for the first time in, what, 16 years? Twelve years uh, to see him on that day, and she's been with him ever since. But one of the people, um, one of the parents, who was just so extraordinary, was a fellow named uh, Calvin Johnson Sr. And that case may have gotten some play around here because it took place in Georgia. Um, Calvin's son, Calvin Jr., uh, grew up in a kind of middle-class uh, black family. In fact, the father had been a state legislator, an assigned counsel lawyer, one of the first black assigned counsel lawyers in the Appalachian uh, part of Ohio before the family moved to Georgia in the 60s uh, during the boom economy period and uh, put three kids through college. Calvin was charged with uh, raping a white woman in Clayton County, Georgia, which is an all-white suburb uh, at the time outside of Atlanta. And um, the extraordinary thing is that Calvin Sr. was the alibi witness. Because Calvin Jr. was home with his mom and dad when the rape allegedly occurred of this white woman uh, who lived in another part of town. And uh, Calvin's father had to sit there throughout the trial as a lawyer, as a lawyer, okay, knowing how the system worked while this evidence was presented against his son. He had to sit there while this all white jury uh, paraded out of the courtroom to commence what turned out to be 45 minutes of deliberations rejecting all the black alibi witnesses and convicting uh, his son, Calvin, and sentencing him to a life in prison. Um, Sixteen and a half years later, we got Calvin out uh, through the Innocence Project using DNA evidence. And uh, we were in the courtroom down in Clayton County uh, last June, and we're talking to his father because, you know, you're all going to be lawyers, and uh, we all believe in the system. We think that ultimately justice will try out. <coughs> And he knew that he knew how it worked, and he knew about all the alibi witnesses his son had and other witnesses. Uh, there was even a major discrepancy in the physical characteristics of the assailant. And so we said, well, what was it like? Why didn't you just sort of scream out during the courtroom, you know, in the courtroom during the commencement of the trial that your son was innocent and that this can't be happening or do something to stop it? 
And he turned to us and he said, boy, you know, you guys are so naive. Uh, you think, you know, it works so easily. He says, my family, we traced my family back to the very first slave ship that came over to Virginia in the early 17th century. And uh, it's something I've learned my whole life, that even though I've become a lawyer and put three, three kids through school, that ultimately, uh, it's with my life experience that, that racism will triumph over justice every time. And it was a very, very difficult thing for us to sort of swallow, uh, given all life experiences and given our expectations. But that was this man's life experience, and we had to come to accept it. That was 45 minutes to drink. But uh, in another part of the country, in about as different a setting as you can possibly imagine, uh, was a man named Timothy Durham. And Tim Durham came from a family that was quite wealthy. Uh, they own the biggest hardware store in town. They own a number of radio stations <coughs> in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, they were influential uh, among the political elites uh, in Tulsa and the state as a whole. Uh, and Tim was with his uh, father uh, at, in Dallas, Texas at something that, that a skeet shooting contest. Maybe you, you do that here. You know, <laughs> guy from Brooklyn, I don't know. Right? You know, they hit those things and they go, Psh! right? So Tim is with his father, who was about, I guess, 68, 69 at the time, uh, who was having some health problems, and he was literally handing him a gun. And they were shooting the skeet, and there were 11 other people in Dallas, Texas. Um, uh, well, 11 people, at least, that they called at the trial. While back in Tulsa, an individual uh, who had some physical characteristics, we believe, that may be similar to him, because we think we know uh, who this person was, um, actually conned his way into the home of an 11-year-old girl and sexually molested her. Uh, four or five months later, uh, through some uh, very suggestive identification techniques, Tim's picture was displayed uh, uh, to this young girl who wasn't sure and then she was convinced, um, and he was eventually uh, arrested and indicted for this crime. Uh, through the use of microscopic hair comparisons, which uh, DNA testing is now showing to be junk science. One of the things that we can now do with DNA testing is extract mitochondrial DNA right from the shaft of the hair. And all these hair comparisons where they were saying these things are matches or even exclusions have been proven to be uh, just unreliable. Uh, it probably was not a very good scientific basis for bringing in the court in the first place, but he was convicted on that basis, uh, the ID, and some bad DNA testing literally uh, a mishandled DNA testing that was later uh, proven to be unreliable by good DNA testing. Uh, eventually, he was let out of jail. Um, but he was convicted with 11 alibi witnesses showing he was in Dallas, Texas, sentenced to 3,225 years in jail, which later on appeal was knocked down to 3,100. Uh, uh, it just shows it can happen to anybody. And it's not just a book about the individuals who were victimized um, in this way through the system. It's also a book about the people who do the victimizing. And there's a fellow who we focus on in one of the chapters, Glendale Woodall. Glendale Woodall was a grave digger uh, uh, from a white working class family in a uh, town in West Virginia. And he was uh, charged and ultimately convicted of raping two different white women at a shopping mall uh, outside of Charleston. And um, it's been one of those days, sorry. Uh, outside of Charleston. And uh, the key piece of evidence, aside from the identification testimony that was partially derived from uh, inappropriate, hypnotically induced uh, refreshed testimony, was evidence that came from the state serologist, a guy named Fred Zane. How many people have heard of Fred Zane? Well, Fred Zane is going to be, I mean, he's like a national legend. He's like, it's like Billy the Kid or, uh, or, or Jesse James. It was this criminal named Fred Zane who happened to be the head of the state crime laboratory in West Virginia. And um, Fred Zane's job was to do the serology. Now, before they had DNA typing, they would do what's called conventional ABO typing, right, where you would look at the ABO type in a rape kit from someone who was just raped, and you would compare it to the blood type of a suspect and see if they match. And then you would come out with a probability of, of, rare, of rareness, and you could testify to that. So he did the, uh, the serological work in this case. He came into court, and he said that uh, Glendale Woodall's blood type was consistent with the semen in both rape kits, 
and that uh, that was very probative evidence of his guilt. Well, he was convicted, uh, I mean, Glendale Woodall was convicted, and uh, years later he was cleared through DNA testing. But they went back, the uh, person who did the DNA testing, to look at the original work done by Zane. And what they found is, is that this guy, Zane, instead of doing the kind of laboratory work that those of you who are considering a career in medicine would have done, no doubt, was doing something known as dry labbing. Now, in dry labbing it, you don't actually do the experiment. You're told by the police that we believe this guy, Woodall, is the perpetrator. You may type Woodall to find out that he's a type B or what other genetic markers he has. And then without ever examining the evidence, you simply write a report saying it's a match. That's called dry labbing it. And others of us just call it scientific fraud. It's a crime. Um, and he had done that in this case. And, and people were so alarmed by it that the Supreme Court of West Virginia decided to set up a, a special commission and a special master who was a retired Supreme Court justice to investigate what went wrong. And they started looking at all the Zane's cases and they found out that in 133 cases in West Virginia, Zane had committed scientific fraud. Not all those people were innocent. Some of them were believed to be guilty and Zane just sort of helped them along by framing, you know, reportedly guilty people. But many of the others were innocent and have since been cleared through DNA typing. Zane had to leave West Virginia. He fled to San Antonio, Texas, where he spent another four years doing phony scientific work for, for private laboratories, including phony DNA tests, saying he had done the test, done the work, written the reports, but there was no DNA work ever done on those cases. People have tried to prosecute Zane. Uh, there's a guy named um, George Castell, who was the head of the public defender system down there, who has been fighting a one-man campaign to get Zane. Uh, Zane was cleared once because they couldn't go after him due to statute of limitations problems. Uh, but now, finally, they're going to try, uh, try him on the ultimate charge. But it's been years since he was first identified, and so far, you know, he's been able to stay out of jail. As you mentioned, he, he, when they uncovered Zane's uh, uh, crimes, really, in West Virginia, he had already gone to San Antonio um, and was running the DNA section of the San Antonio crime lab, faking DNA tests led to the conviction of a guy named Jack Davis, who was a janitor in a uh, Now, one of the nice things about uh, the reviews in this book, which uh, we're pleased to say have been pretty good, and then actually really were very happy, but the best reviews are the ones where they say, well, they're not partisan. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, having isolated one of the causes of wrongful convictions, uh, we felt a tremendous responsibility to propose <coughs> Uh, concrete proposals that uh, Republicans and Democrats, prosecutors, uh, defense attorneys and judges could all get behind because there are such measures out there. And before we go into some of them specifically, we'd like to give you one big overview idea uh, that we hope you could implement in this state uh, and all across the country. And it's the basic concept of an innocence commission. And it's real simple. When an airplane falls from the sky or a car blows up, or there's an unexpected death in a hospital. What happens is that the National Transportation and Safety Board is brought in. Uh, there's some kind of official reinvestigation post-mortem where you ask, is this individual error? Is this system error where there's nobody's fault? Did somebody break any rules? But most important of all, what went wrong? Let's find out. And how can we fix it? Or at least come up with measures that will minimize the chance of another total failure, total system failure happening again. Every institution in this country where the life and liberty of citizens at stake will engage in such a rational scientific process, except the criminal justice system. When these people walked out of jail after their convictions were vacated with DNA tests, you cannot find in Westlaw, you cannot find in Lexis an opinion written about these cases or any kind of an assessment of what went wrong. We just don't do that in the criminal justice system. Well, maybe a due process rule is violated. Uh, maybe there will be an opinion on that. But when it comes to a total system failure, an innocent person being convicted, we do not systematically study it. And that's something we should begin to do. In Canada, after a gentleman named Guy Pomeran was exonerated by DNA tests, they formed a commission of inquiry that went on for about two years, where they took testimony. And then they implemented reforms on microscopic care evidence, rules for uh, jailhouse informants, uh, other reforms of police, lawyers, prosecutors across the board. Uh, they have a similar institution in England. In fact, 
when you look at Illinois, the governor of Illinois, as you all know, has just called a moratorium on the death penalty, which simply means he won't sign any death warrants. Uh, ostensibly as a result of 13 innocent people being sentenced to death in the state of Illinois since the reinstitution of the death penalty and 12 people being executed. But most interestingly, what he also has said he will do is appoint a blue ribbon panel to investigate why those 13 people were convicted and sentenced to death to see if the, something that could be done to fix the system. And these are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about in various different forms in each state across the country. What's extraordinary, by the way, just to, to follow up on that, is that um, you may have heard just two weeks ago uh, presidential candidate Governor George W. Bush of Texas in responding to the moratorium called by Governor Ryan in Illinois said, well, that's an Illinois problem. In Texas, we know how to do it right. And I, for one, am convinced every one of the 109, I believe, death warrants that have been signed during my uh, administration were you know, right on the mark that the people were tried by a jury of 12, that appellate courts have reviewed those convictions and affirmed them, and therefore we can stand behind them. Well, in all 13 of those cases, the people were exonerated and taken off of death row in Illinois. They, too, were convicted by juries of 12. They, too, had their convictions affirmed on appeal. And uh, it is really uh, a lot of temerity on the part of, uh, of Bush to think that somehow it is an Illinois problem. Where well, at least in Illinois, there is a state public defender system, which they do not have in the state of Texas. In addition to thinking about a commission, however, we actually offer uh, concrete recommendations to deal with each and every one of these causes of unjust conviction. That's a very important part of the book. And when you look at the book, part of the discussion in the social science uh, research is woven into the stories. Um, seamlessly. <laughs> seamlessly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, stories. But it's all very quick. Gut wrenching. Gut wrenching. But uh, in addition to that, those recommendations also appear at the end. And, and some of them are just worth noting uh, in, in, quickly so you get a sense of what we're talking about. For instance, we said that the single biggest factor contributing to unjust convictions is mistaken eyewitnesses. There are some very, very simple reforms that can be introduced uh, that grow out of a, a vast, rich body of social science research over the last 20 years, some of which have been now included in recommendations distributed this, this past year by the, uh, the, the National Institute of Justice of the United States Department of Justice. And they include simple things that everybody could agree on. Obviously, um, if, if the person who's going to be doing the identification proceeding is not the detective doing the investigation, but is a neutral detective, he or she is less likely either verbally or non-verbally to provide certain cues to bolster uh, the, the conclusions or identification or non-identification by a particular witness. That's one of the recommendations. Um, another one is to, is to, instead of simply showing a people a group of six photographs or eight photographs where people start making relative judgments, show them one photograph at a time and tell them in advance, hey, look, we're going to show you some photographs one at a time. If you see anybody who you think is the perpetrator, tell us. If you don't, that's okay too. We will continue with the investigation. So the person doesn't feel compelled to make an identification, even if it's the wrong one. So that's the kinds of recommendations we, we, we make for eyewitness ID. Uh, for confessions, remember we said that extraordinarily the second most you know, common problem here, other than with uh, science, uh, sloppy science uh, that we didn't expect, uh, had to do with uh, false confessions. Um, and uh, to deal with false confessions, it's very, very simple. Mandatory taping of all interrogation, preferably videotaping. But if you're, let's say you're, you're questioning a suspect on the way to the station house, at least use an audio tape. Make it a requirement. It's done in England. It's done in Australia. In this country, it's now done in Alaska and Minnesota. And guess what? The prosecutors and police in those jurisdictions like it because it's going to, on the one hand, certainly help a defendant who is being falsely accused with certain statements attributed to him they didn't make, but likewise, it's going to support an officer who did a credible job, who did things the right way, where some defendant is concocting a story about being coerced or having a statement made up. So everybody wins with a simple reform. Now, even Paul Cassell from the University of Utah, who's trying to get rid of Miranda, uh, thinks that the videotaping and uh, uh, audio taping of interrogations is a good idea. It's to a lot of conservative uh, scholars. Now, another thing that you can do 
uh, that's pretty simple, uh, and that is provide post-conviction DNA testing for those who could use it to prove innocence. Because that's, after all, all we're really doing uh, at our Innocence Project. Uh, unfortunately, in 75% of the cases where uh, people write to us and say, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, uh, we can't find the samples anymore. They're either supposedly lost or destroyed. Uh, but in instances where we can find the samples, uh, more than two-thirds of the time, the results are favorable to the individual. So there are a lot of people out there, um, as we indicated before with that 25% statistic, uh, who can prove their innocence with the DNA test. But in 33 states, there's a statute of limitations of six <coughs> months or less uh, on getting the test. There are only two states, Illinois and New York, that have statutes that say, if a DNA test could prove your innocence, then you should be entitled to get the opportunity for that kind of a test. And if you can't afford it, the state would uh, uh, help pay for it. Uh, needless to say, there are 14 post-conviction DNA testers <coughs> in Illinois and seven in New York, the two highest totals in the country. It's not uh, an accident. Uh, about a month ago, three weeks ago now, uh, time flies, Senator Leahy introduced something called the Innocence Protection Act. Uh, and one of the provisions of that bill uh, that we're hopeful Republicans would support as well, has to do with allowing post-conviction DNA testing tied into the DNA data banking statute. So all states, including this one, have a DNA data bank where you have the types of convicted felons and you try to put in unsolved crime DNA profiles. Well, if you want federal money for that, and it's a good thing, you should have such uh, 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 <coughs> institutions, uh, you should also provide uh, DNA tests for those who could use it to prove innocent. In 15 of the 70 DNA exonerations, uh, DNA has helped identify the person who really committed the crime. And with the rise of data banks, even, that will happen even more. For every innocent person that is uh, wrongfully arrested and convicted, uh, somebody else who really committed the crime is out on the street committing more crimes. So there's really good, no, no good law enforcement explanation against this. Sloppy science, fraudulent science. You'd be surprised to know that in New York State, uh, Barry and I were part of a bill that was, helped write a bill that was passed setting up a forensic science commission. And we now serve as commissioners uh, in New York State helping to regulate all 22 state and local law enforcement uh, crime laboratories. And the purpose of it is very simple. Let's start treating crime laboratories the same way we do clinical laboratories. Uh, the clinical laboratories that you go to if you have a growth on your hand and you have to have it biopsy. Uh, they're, they're regulated. They're regulated so you can have some assurance in the validity or reliability of the uh, diagnosis that comes out of that laboratory. Uh, similarly, laboratories that are doing scientific tests that determine whether you live or die or lose your liberty for 50 or 75 years should also have those kind of quality assurances and quality controls in place. So we're in favor of a, of a, of a much more elaborate regulatory scheme for crime labs all over the country, which currently does not exist. New York is the only state that has it. But separate and apart from these different causes, there is one factor that seems to run through, unfortunately, all these, or not all these cases, but runs through all the other factors, such as ID, confessions, police misconduct, bad lawyers, uh, in greater frequency when the defendant is a black man and the victim is a white woman. Um, Generally speaking, in this country, most rapes, overwhelmingly, are committed by people within the same race. That is, black men rape black women, white men rape white women. Uh, the, the Department of Justice, which produces statistics on reports of sexual assaults, has consistently over the last decade found that about 10.7% of all sexual assaults reported involve white women and black men as the perpetrators. Surprisingly, half, half of all these unjust conviction cases involve black men who were convicted of committing what used to be called in some states the usual crime. And it's not surprising. Uh, in the first half of this century, in the first half of this century, rape was considered a capital offense. In the book, we spent a little bit of time discussing Georgia, and we discussed Georgia because that's what Calvin Johnson fellow I talked about earlier was convicted of raping, a black man convicted of raping that white woman by an all-white jury uh, in Clayton County, Georgia. But in the state of Georgia, during the first half of this century, 62 men were executed or lynched 
for committing the crime of rape. Of those 62, 58 were black men. So why are we here, As other than to shamelessly sell our book? Um, what we've been doing, rather than uh, frankly doing the usual kind of things you do to sell books with media, is going to law schools and hopefully journalism schools across the country because we feel that uh, this is a kind of unique moment uh, in terms of criminal justice policy in the United States. You know, nothing ever like this has happened where so many innocent people got out of jail so quickly and in a fashion that nobody can dispute. Nobody is saying that these people are guilty. They're all stone cold innocent. Um, and it provides us with a really remarkable window to look at the rest of the criminal justice system and come up with an agenda for change uh, that uh, reasonable people on all sides of the aisle can support. And we feel that uh, the law schools and the journalism schools in particular um, are the best vehicles for getting this done. Whether it's legislative proposals, uh, 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 study of a lot of these issues, but more importantly, cases. Uh, more than we ever suspected, as even the most jaded and cynical of criminal defense lawyers and uh, uh, legal academicians, or what do you call it, law professors, right? Law <laughs> um, there are just more people in jail uh, because this system, in many of its most important parts, is broken. Uh, not the least of which, frankly, is just the lousy representation that people reveal, uh, receive. Uh, there are lots of people in jail, I will bet you, in this state, uh, on capital, but most particularly non-capital cases, which if somebody did a reinvestigation of their case, uh, a serious reinvestigation of their case, would uh, uh, demonstrate that they're innocent. The model is really not so much uh, what we've been doing with DNA testing, but what's been going on in Illinois. You all know of the journalism school at Northwestern and the law school there, um, where they actually have begun reinvestigating the cases and proving the people innocent. We, when we went to uh, Washington, when Senator Leahy introduced his legislation, we met 18-year-old uh, Sean Armbrust, who was a journalism student at Northwestern, who received a, an assignment uh, from her, her professor, David Protest, uh, just to look into the case of Anthony Porter, a young man who was uh, mentally retarded, who was on death row, who was about to be executed. I think he actually was scheduled two days to execution. Um, and within four months, she and her colleagues went out, went to the crime scene, realized that the witnesses who had testified that he had done it couldn't have seen it, did some more reinvestigation, and finally wound up with a guy confessing to the crime that Porter was about to be executed for. Uh, this can happen again and again and again when you begin to focus on some of these cases. Now, we realize that it's a difficult process to put together programs like this, that it's not going to be all that many cases, that it's a difficult process of vetting them. Uh, but I think that we have a responsibility to fix this system. And we can do it. And so uh, it's also those reporters uh, that uh, Peter was talking about, uh, Ken Armstrong, Steve Mills, Morris Posley, who wrote this incredible series about death row in Illinois, analyzing uh, well, how many of these cases came about from jailhouse snitches, from hair comparisons, from bad serology, and most importantly, bad lawyers? Their analysis showed that 33 people, over 20% of the prisoners on death row in Illinois, had been represented by lawyers who, subsequent to, their, to that representation, were suspended or disbarred. And that, it was that work that finally pushed the governor of Illinois to declare that moratorium. Thank you. It can happen here just the way it happened. Here. You folks are blessed. And unlike a lot of the other schools we've been visiting, you already have two very dedicated faculty members here, Teresa and Jim. Can you call yourselves by your first names here? Um, uh, it's hard to know what the uh, is. Um, that would be know, scary. Poor, poor <laughs> He actually refers to himself in the third person. <laughs> That's all. Uh, I'm one of those happy. In any event, yeah. Um, who are already committed to this project here, and that's fantastic. A lot of the other schools we went to, you know, we're trying to get people to move in that direction, and they're interested in moving. Um, there is no question that if you get involved in just a few of these cases, and you have that opportunity to simply save a single life, 
or to take somebody out of prison who is factually innocent, it will not only change that person's life, it can not only have repercussions which affect the entire criminal justice system in the state, but it will also change your life. Um, sometimes people wonder why we do this, because uh, a lot of it's pro bono work, a lot of it's pretty tiring, but there are selfish reasons. The, one of the first people we got out was a guy named Tony Steiner, who I mentioned before, who was the uh, oil burner repairman who lived, now you folks would never pronounce oil that way, would you? That's, that's Brooklyn. <laughs> but um, in any event, he was an oil burner repairman living with his parents in Virginia, and he was unjustly convicted in a rape case and sentenced to prison for 45 years. He had a mother who was unbelievable, who stood by him. She worked as a, uh, as a postal clerk. She took a night shift so she could have her days free to fight for her son's freedom. Uh, she found out who the leading scientist was in Europe who started the forensic DNA uh, testing technology. She wrote to him. She contacted the president, the senators, the governor, everybody she could. She got a hold of the Innocence Project. And eventually, eventually, we were able to do the testing uh, that uh, cleared her son. Now, we couldn't go into court in, in Virginia because it was one of the 33 states in the United States that has what's called a, a very strict statute of limitations on when you can go back into court, even if you have stone cold, out, stone cold uncontroverted evidence of innocence uh, after you've been convicted. 21 days after conviction, you were too late, you're out of court. You can only go back into court within 21 days of the jury verdict. That was the Virginia rule. So we had to seek a pardon. And of course, uh, to uh, a governor who's running for election, even when the pardon request comes from the defense attorney and is joined in by the prosecutor, and the trial judge who convicted him signs on, it's still sat on that governor's desk for months. Until some uh, aggressive reporters in Richmond said, enough is enough, you better do the right thing. And, and we got a call one day that he had done the right thing, and he was signing the pardon, and that I could come down and get uh, Tony out of prison. I called his mom, who I'd never met before. We talked, God knows, a hundred times on the telephone, uh, but we had never met personally. That I was coming flying down to Richmond, she should greet me there, and we'll go down and get her son out of uh, Nottoway Prison uh, in the southern part of the state. Got on this plane, flew down to Richmond, and it's one of these airports which doesn't have a bridge to the terminal. You have to walk down the steps on the tarmac. And I walked down those steps on the tarmac in the middle of the afternoon, and all of a sudden, this um, middle-aged woman uh, comes bounding down the runway. I mean, literally, just sort of running in my direction. And this, uh, and, you know, and, and she's a big woman. <laughs> and I, at first, I don't know what's going on. Then I realized, my God, it's Tony's mother. And she gets to me, and she just simply puts her arms around me in this extraordinary bear hug and lifts me right off the ground. <laughs> and it wasn't Barry, it was me. <laughs> And um, all I can tell you is, it is, it is to this day, one of the most extraordinary emotional encounters I've ever had in my entire life. And that little encounter will affect everything else I do, as a lawyer, as a father, as a member of the community, until the day I die. So what questions do you have of us? Yes? How did your work affect your view of the death penalty? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think it just, uh, you know, the, the problem with the death penalty in America uh, is not uh, simply that one may have moral differences about the morality of somebody putting people to death. Uh, the American Bar Association has been on record for, I guess it's close to four years now, uh, saying that they're for a moratorium of the death penalty uh, because any objective analysis of the system indicates that, A, uh, we can't be sure that the right decision is being made. Uh, for every seven people executed in this country, one person comes off death row on the grounds that newly discovered evidence of innocence shows that it's likely the person didn't commit the crime. I mean, literally, the conviction is vacated on the grounds of newly discovered evidence, and they're either uh, pardoned or not retried. Um, and that's 85 people altogether since the institution of death penalty. Only eight of those, not that that's a small number, uh, but were deeper as a result of DNA. So uh, that's quite an extraordinary figure. And then, of course, when you go into the whole issue of uh, uh, whether we're making rational decisions on who deserves to get death and who doesn't, 
and the quality of representation that people get, uh, these are all very difficult questions. I mean, personally, I was against the death penalty before we started getting all these citizen people out of jail, but uh, uh, putting aside that whole issue, I think it brings to uh, it brings to the fore the question that right now, I don't think anybody can say uh, who studies this with any seriousness that we have any confidence that we're doing this fairly or making the right decisions. Yeah, and, and you should know. I mean, the reason that the gov Governor Ryan, Governor Ryan realized that the machinery of death in Illinois was broken if there could be so many innocent people. And the only difference between Illinois and Texas or North Carolina or Georgia or New York or any of these other states is that in Illinois you have this dedicated cadre of law students, <coughs> lawyers, uh, journalists and journalism students who are out there pounding the cement to reinvestigate these cases. And if you had that same kind of commitment in North Carolina, in Georgia, in New York, in Texas, my God, you would quadruple the number of exonerations right there. But it's not, it's not just death cases. I mean, the truth of the matter is that when people uh, are exonerated in any kind of serious felony case, um, you know, obviously what happens is if you're lifting up a rock and you're seeing some of the things that are wrong with the system, be the lawyers, the prosecutors, the crime labs, um, and you can fix it. Uh, but it also, I think, undermines uh, confidence that we really have the precision in the system uh, to exact the final and ultimate and irreversible penalty. Can you just discuss some of the uh, issues surrounding mandatory testing of, of criminal defendants, and both not exonerate those that are free, but also try to convict those that might be guilty? I mean, there are probably constitutional issues surrounding. Are you talking about the DNA data things? Um, no, like actually, if there, if if a DNA testing looks like it would be applicable in a particular case, required the criminal defendant to provide samples or something so that it could be. Uh, You're talking about yeah, no, you no, might no. get a test. Yeah. Whether Not, the constitutional argument that you should be entitled to get it. No, 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 no. You should be talking about the prosecution, prosecution using DNA testing to help convict people. Well, and also we, to exonerate. People. Yeah, no, no. We, I mean, no, no, no. We, 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 we sit on this regulatory commission in New York, which regulates DNA data banks. We are actually advocates of DNA data banks of convicted uh, felons. Uh, we believe that DNA typing should be used very, very frequently now in cases by prosecutors uh, to help identify the real perpetrator, by defense attorneys if they believe that uh, their client is innocent. We think it's an extremely useful tool for all sides that, uh, that, that the truth will surface. Um, <coughs> What people have to realize, though, is that all these, we didn't say this before, all these causes, by the way, of unjust convictions, are not going to go away with the advent of routine DNA testing. Because most of these, most of the cases involving violent crime in this country do not involve any biological material. Burglaries don't. Uh, a lot of murders don't. 25% uh, of the sexual assaults, there's no, uh, there's no semen. So all these other problems will continue to exist. So if we don't start reforming these problems, even with routine DNA testing, we're doomed to have thousands of other unjust convictions. Is that your question? Well, in, uh, are there any constitutional implications of going to a, a criminal defendant and saying you must supply? Uh, no, so I don't think. I mean, if you're saying if you ask a criminal problem, defendant to see whether or not uh, his DNA matches DNA, you a prosecutor require. If there's probable, sure. if there's probable cause, there you can. The person's sure. already arrested because there's probable cause and indicted. It's not testimony like Schmerber. Sure, yeah. that's not a hard one. Yeah. Uh, yes. What advice would you have to public defenders and people who are doing criminal law to try to abate this problem and to try to, on the front end, to try to, what issues should they be looking for and try to be aware of and what can they do to try to prevent these kinds of situations? Well, I think that it's time that the, uh, uh, and, and one reason it's good if it comes from, uh, you know, law schools in conjunction with uh, the private bar, public defenders, but as a, they're kind of a neutral, that's why we tried to write this, uh, coming from a neutral perspective. There's, this is a great time to do sensible, non-demagoguery uh, kinds of reforms of the system. I mean, you know, people really can't be comfortable where, you, where an inmate who's about to be executed or spending years in jail can't get a DNA test to prove innocence. Uh, frankly, that is the constitutional argument I thought you were asking me about. I have, we happen to think we litigate this. Uh, that it is, uh, it violates due process in the Eighth Amendment not to allow somebody to get the test. And what we wound up doing in the Innocence Project, uh, 
if there is no statute, there's only a statute in two states, is that we wind up bringing uh, civil rights actions, 1983 actions, for injunctive relief. We begin to do that when people resist this. But, you know, just look at the whole panoply of reforms that we're trying to lay out here. Uh, it's about time that people try to take uh, uh, affirmative steps to fix the system, and this is the right time, because we've never really had this kind of revelation machine that can lay bare uh, some of uh, the problems in the system. I mean, seven people and more coming. It's, it's really yes. extraordinary. How much does it cost on that? Do you do DNA testing? Um, you know, it depends. Obviously, the kind of DNA testing that's done by the State Crime Laboratory in North Carolina routinely in new cases is probably relatively inexpensive in the hundreds of dollars. In these post-conviction DNA cases, we find that on average it's about $3,000. And that's because they're much older cases. The, the specimens remaining are very tiny. We have to send them out quite often because it's not being done by a government laboratory to a private laboratory, which, which ends up charging more. But, but it's worth it because they, they spend a lot of care and time uh, getting it right. Um, uh, so there is that, that cost. But the cost is a pittance. Because to keep an innocent man, to keep anybody in prison, on average in the United States, is about 25 grand a year. So you take somebody uh, like uh, Clyde Charles, who we got out in December of 99, spent 19 years for a rape he didn't commit down in Angola prison, you know, the farm in Louisiana. The last nine of those 19 years, he was petitioning to get post-conviction DNA testing. It took him nine years to get the test, which finally excluded him. Um, and then he got out. That's 275 grand right there that could have been saved if they had just given him the test when he first asked for it. So, you know, in any one of these cases, if you get one exclusion, that can finance the DNA testing for, you know, the rest of the people in the state plus then some. They don't quite do the math like that in the criminal justice system. <laughs> but the, uh, some, they can be more expensive than that. If you do the mitochondrial test, they run a little bit, they can run, you know, 
No one challenged any of the methodologies utilized by the other laboratories, state and private laboratories, that did the DNA work. It's just that as you're aware of it, when with any of these cases, you know, when the pundits get involved, the newspapers spin it, the points may be different than the reality. Um, but um, one of the things that we're talking about now, obviously, is accrediting all these laboratories so those kinds of problems won't occur. Generally speaking now, the DNA evidence is communicated pretty effectively and cogently to the fact finder, be it a jury or a judge. And, it, and you know, it is what it is, it, particularly in these sexual assault cases, when we're doing it. There are two things you should know. Unlike, unlike uh, a hair that may be found in a room where they do DNA testing or a blood stain someplace, as you can appreciate in a rape case, because almost all these cases are either rape cases or rape homicide cases, and generally speaking, we're testing semen that's recovered from a woman's intimate, uh, you know, uh, bodily parts. So consequently, there is, if consent is not an issue, how else did the evidence get there? Okay, other than being left by the rapist, and by the real rapist. Mm -hmm. um, and once you appreciate that, you realize that there are certain controls in the way they do the testing, and that it would really take, if someone wanted to sort of fabricate the evidence or cross-contaminate it, some technician would have to somehow remove the semen or DNA that was part of this rape kit initially, that's mixed with the woman's biological fluids, but somehow not touch the woman's fluids, and then either ejaculate on that evidence himself, or use an eyedropper full of semen, because that's what it would take, then those arguments about contamination and manipulating the evidence sort of fall by the wayside, and the truth comes out. And that's why even in the Kotler case, the case that you were referring to where a person four years later committed a rape, there was, no, there was no defense he could raise to the DNA evidence which convicted him. See, the, the funny thing is, is that the Simpson case did very little good that I can see for the criminal justice system. But the, over, the only silver lining is that the critique of the collection and handling of the evidence and the way it was done in the labs is accepted as correct. Across the country, the labs have been promote, uh, trying to get credited now. Uh, in great numbers, and we hand out in this uh, federal commission I'm on, on DNA testing, a uh, pamphlet to uh, law enforcement officers. It's entitled, What Every Law Enforcement Officer Ought to Know About DNA. And it says, don't put wet samples into plastic bags. Always change your gloves. Don't wait, but you know, I mean, it, it reads like the cross of the evidence handbook. Now, I mean, it's the only silver lining I can see in that whole, sorry. Yes. The economic consequences of keeping somebody in prison as opposed to letting them free. What reasons do the state or does the justice system support for, for not allowing somebody to have a DNA test, test once he has been convicted? Nothing. Uh, there is no sensible argument other than the fact, frankly, that uh, people are reluctant uh, to look into old cases. Uh, we're a law school, so I'll give you the, uh, the legal argument. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States case that deals with the issue of actual innocence, hence the title of our book, is Herrera versus Collins. Um, and this was a case where you do have six votes from justices in the United States Supreme Court saying, if you could prove that somebody about to be executed, and it's easy to infer uh, from that somebody in jail uh, is actually innocent, if you had that proof, then that's something that would violate due process in the Eighth Amendment. But the court was saying in the particular case before, they didn't come close to proving it. The rationale of Justice Rehnquist uh, that justifies these statutes of limitations on newly discovered evidence generally uh, is the fair point that if you come forward 20 years later with a witness recantation or some proof that uh, uh, would vacate a conviction, and then we were to retry the case 20 years later, how can you be assured that the fact-finding process 20 years later would be any more reliable than the one that we had 20 years earlier? Because people disappear, evidence gets lost, etc. But when it comes to denial of question, I think we should have uh, safety valves for newly discovered evidence, and we shouldn't have these statute of limitations generally. But in the case of DNA, it is particularly unjustifiable because 20 years later, you do have more reliable information. You can get a more more reliable fact finding because you can analyze samples that are 15, 20 years old quite reliable. Separate and apart from that, though, uh, I mean, there's, there, there's something which I'm sure you've read about in law school known as the doctrine of finality, which, in addition to the reasons that Barry already described, there's a notion that once the jury has spoken, once you've exhausted your appeals, we have to bring closure to a case. 
is a psychological component to the resistance that we meet in a lot of these cases, which is, and quite frankly, a lot of prosecutors don't, I mean, do not want to admit that there's been a miscarriage of justice, uh, that they played a part personally in, uh, in sending an innocent person to uh, prison. Um, there is then a recognition once you get that far that if I send an innocent person to prison, that means that the person who actually committed the crime is still out there, that I haven't worked closer to the victim either. And not only that, but if they, as Barry said, if they lift up that stone in this case, my God, what they're going to find, you know, we might be doing wrong on a system-wide basis in our particular jurisdiction. So for all those kinds of reasons, we've had, we have that kind of resistance. I think we have time for one more question. What, what you, what's our time situation? Uh, I think one, more. one more question. You've talked so far about cases that have gone to trial. Have some of the cases that you've uh, looked into and found instances involved people who pled guilty perhaps because they wanted to avoid a possible death sentence? We, yeah, we have one people. person, there's one person in the book, only one, and he was somebody who was deficient mentally uh, in Virginia who pled guilty to avoid capital punishment. But what's interestingly uh, uh, about this whole new uh, revelation involving the Los Angeles Police Department and those cases that that one precinct called the Rampart Precinct is that in the first 40 cases uh, that have been now overturned where people have been framed by these police officers, it appears that in about 75% of those cases, the defendants pled guilty, okay? And what does that I mean? Obviously, they were under some pressure because they have these three strike laws, uh, because they have no preliminary hearings, because they were facing either two years in prison if they pled guilty, or they risked 25 to life if they were convicted. It also means that their lawyers played a role in encouraging them to plead guilty. So it raises a lot of serious factors. In fact, when we went out and talked to the law schools in Los Angeles, we suggested there's a rich body of data now for their innocence project. Okay, it's those cases coming out of the Los Angeles Police Department. So uh, thank you.